basically I'm going to take you through a year's project. Um, and I just want to start a little bit by the word on the, the left, because um, you're probably aware that our education is in complete crisis um, at all levels, I think, but we're going to focus mainly on secondary level. And when uh, Megan and YSI approached us, initially approached us as a funding organisation to talk about how the YSI might get involved with secondary school teachers and address some of the challenges of teaching sculpture, it's something that we've been thinking about anyway, and so it made sense that instead of just being a funding body, we partnered up. So part of the excitement of this project was not just about challenging what's happening in schools and what's happening around sculpture in schools, but also about joining up two completely different contexts for teachers, and so creating a conversation between teachers based here in Yorkshire and teachers based in London. And we, we tried various things, which I'll talk a bit more about, including a sort of e -pen pal sort of dating agency we appeared to set up to join yeah. Teachers Go. It didn't quite work out <laughs> as we hoped. Um, so what was very exciting about this project for us right at the very beginning was the provocations that Phila de Barlow set for the YSI as a whole. And it, they felt very pertinent to addressing some of these questions about how sculpture sits within schools. And of course, Phila de Barlow is a tremendously important person when it comes to both the words that this presentation started with. Not only is she, you know, one of the most kind of respected British sculptors, but she is also, I'd argue, one of the most respected British art teachers. And Fuller spent most of her career teaching. And she talks a lot about the idea of the symbiosis between making and being an artist and that role of teaching. And that it isn't a necessary evil that you do until you don't have to do it anymore, but that the two things fit together very, very well. So Fuller has set how many provocations, Megan? 68, <coughs> 68 provocations. And... Um, she also said, I think, some of these she believed in. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to grab some water. And some of them she didn't, which is a nice way to start. Um, but I thought we'd start with this one, because the first question that Megan and I had when we were talking about the project was, what were the challenges? This is what we were going to ask the, the teachers. What were the challenges? And we kind of knew what the answers to that question were going to be. This one, of course, is the first one. We all know that budgets in schools have been cut. I mean, if we're honest, budgets in art departments in school have always been a bit shit. So even though, you know, the English department get lots of money, the history department get lots of money, and they claim, they would claim, I taught for a long time, so I know what I'm talking about, uh, they would claim, the heads of department would claim they needed the money to buy books. And we all know that they don't buy textbooks anymore, but they still claim they need all this money to buy books. While the art department, on the other hand, go along pleading for materials and get almost nothing. And by the time I finished teaching, it was things like you're sharing a print stick amongst the whole department. And when the lid goes missing, it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> so we know, we know that funds, funds are a problem. And going back to what Philip has said in that provocation, sculpture is expensive. So the first thing the teachers told us was, we can't afford to make sculpture. The second problem was space. Again, you know, we know that space is a premium. Sculpture is big and messy and expensive, takes, takes up all this space. And schools, with budgets being cut, what happens when budgets get cut is class sizes go up. If there's more children in a room, there's less space for objects in a room. The classrooms themselves get smaller. I, when I was teaching, we had a, under that kind of PFI thing, we got our school rebuilt. And the head then said, we're going to make all the classrooms the size for 20 students. Because she said, over my dead body, will we ever have a class size bigger than 20? Well... Uh, they, she didn't last very long. She left, and of course the new head came and had made no such promises. And within a couple of years, we had class sizes of over 30 in rooms designed to take 20. So there's no space in classrooms in schools, so you can't make sculpture because you haven't got space to do it. Then, of course, there's time. Now, everybody in here pretty much is probably old enough to remember when you've got things like double lessons in art. So you had a couple of hours. Well, forget that. Now you're lucky if you get a whole hour. You're lucky if you get it once a week. You know, in some places, they only see them maybe for a term, and it's on a rotation. And perhaps they have a 45-minute lesson. Now, imagine 30 kids coming into a room that's too small to be taught sculpture for a 45-minute lesson. I mean, really, by the time you've done the register and checked the uniform and made sure they've got their homework done, you've maybe got 15 minutes practical time and you've got to clear up. So we understood this was what they were going to say. And then the next one was predictable as well, skills. So, so many teachers would say, we actually don't know what we're doing. Uh, with sculpture. We're scared of teaching sculpture because we don't know how to make it ourselves. So that was a problem. And then finally this one, although in fact this is a myth, many teachers believe the curriculum makes it difficult for them to teach sculpture. In fact, you can read the whole National Curriculum for Art, it's really short, um, and it doesn't stop you doing anything. It's the interpretation of it 
So it's the perception of the curriculum that was a problem. So with the teachers in London, the first thing I did, and I think the same thing happened up here in Yorkshire, was we looked at what they were already doing. You know, if you're going to work out how you address some of the challenges, you have to look at what they're doing. And because of some of these things, some of the teachers weren't doing anything at all. They didn't teach sculpture. Nothing three-dimensional happened in their classrooms at all. Some are doing things like this. So predictable, pedestrian, and a bit rubbish. Because remember, we're talking about secondary schools, OK? So you know, this, this, is, this is quite poor, really, for sculpture in schools. Um, some people, on the other hand, are doing some quite inventive things and are already addressing some of those problems that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, this guy talked about the fact that he was one of those people who, who had lessons of less than an hour, and he was on a rotational thing. So he got students for two terms. They did two terms of art, had a term where they would do something else. And he said, well, I haven't got any money, and I haven't got any space, and I haven't got any time. So what we do is we make really, really fast things out of materials that cost almost nothing, and that I can just flatten up and store in a drawer at the end. So these, these sculptures, I'm beautifully photographed, um, they just squashed them up afterwards and either put them in recycling or put them in a drawer. He didn't need loads of storage space. And they took about 15 minutes to make. But he was already talking about well, the, the kind of conversations they were having around the making of these things. And then in some cases, there was some really sophisticated work going on, um, where students in the schools were already beginning to unpick and think about themselves <coughs> in a sort of sculptural way. So we had a really mixed bag. We were working with 10 teachers in London, and Megan and her team were working with 10 teachers in Yorkshire. And they were, in both cases, they were this real breadth of experience from absolutely no confidence and not teaching sculpture at all to really quite sophisticated things going on for sort of 11 to 18 year olds being, uh, being the people making them. And then we looked a bit more at some of these Fuller de Barlow statements. And these two statements, which we thought were linked, really rang out to the group in London. And it started a conversation around how they'd been designing and developing their curriculum. And again, going back to this idea of experience, I think the least experienced teacher I was working with was in their first year of teaching, and the most experienced teacher was a head of department who'd been teaching for nearly 25 years. So it was a real breadth of experience. But they all talked about the fact that they were guilty of this, that all of their projects were based around issues. So whether it was identity, climate change, or refugees, or Donald Trump. They would come up with themes and ideas, and then they would generate projects around them. And they realized that maybe this was a problem in terms of teaching sculpture. And it was a problem which is illustrated in this statement from Philip de Barlow's list. And we had a really interesting conversation quite early on around whether or not any of the teachers had ever had a lesson where they'd just given students a material and said, what can you do with this? And the realization we had, which is kind of remarkable, was none of them had ever done that. In a collective, probably 70 years worth of teaching, not one teacher had ever done a lesson where they'd just given kids materials and said, what can you do with this? So they realized that they were maybe restricting the way in which we think around making, and we think through making. And it's kind of interesting thinking about, I came in a bit late because the trains were terrible this morning, but some of the stuff being talked about around the role of kind of fabrication this morning. You know, what is the relationship, that haptic relationship that was talked about one of the questions, between physically using a material and how it makes you think in a different way? And so there was this kind of realization that maybe the way the teachers were working wasn't allowing that within their classrooms. So the project took lots of, lots of forms. This is the, the Yorkshire group uh, having a, a workshop with, a, with an artist, and then this is the London group doing something similar. So there was a lot of responding to what the teachers told us they wanted to do. And this idea about not feeling like they had skills, so they wanted to learn skills. This was Holly Hendry, who's got her show opening up at YSP this evening, uh, doing a casting workshop with the, the teachers down in London. And they talked about not feeling the confidence about to expand the curriculum. So we had lots of discussion stuff. So we did, we did different things. But what came out of it, you can see they're obviously having a good time here, was the importance of this. And this is a word that actually is missing almost all the time now in education, certainly in schools. It's just disappeared. You know, Even in primary schools, it's terrifying. You don't get the chance to do this because everything's being pressured into certain kinds of ways of assessment and certain metrics. So play. How can we play? And because we were talking to a group of teachers who were, in lots of ways, underconfident about materials and underconfident about doing stuff, actually play was the best way around doing that. You know, getting them to try things out with materials and not worrying about 
failing. It wasn't about making exciting work. It was just about trying things out. It was a, it was a real door opener. So what happened? Well, the kind of work that they started making in their schools changed fantastically. Remember the, the masks, the first set of work? Well, uh, this is the same teacher after a few months doing this. Uh, this was encouraging students to bring in their wardrobe, and they just hung their clothes around the room in a lesson. And they played around with the idea of how the space could be articulated differently using those found materials. Um, this is an example from one of the schools up in Yorkshire. This idea of uh, students engaging with their own bodies and their relationship to the space they were in and how they might make stuff that was about, about that and, and stuff that was temporary. And again, thinking back to that list of challenges that they came up with, you know, this, didn't, this doesn't require storage and it doesn't require very much time. You know, it's about opening up their, their minds. This is a, another one of the London schools, again, the same kind of thing. So really starting to think differently about how sculpture might work within a school environment. Back to Philida's lovely statement. This was another one. Actually, this one came up right at the beginning because it's such a lovely piece of poetry. And when you start thinking about what sculpture might be, this idea of the relationship between the person and the material and the space in which it's in, all sorts of exciting things come about. Remember, no budget, no time, no storage, and so on. So things like this. These are rather lovely. Literally, little bits of sponge bought in a pound shop and then some string. And those are the two materials the students were given, and these are the kinds of things that they made with them. And from the same teacher, this, which were just little lumps of clay. I'm playing around with that. And again, this is a role of documentation. How do you, how do you kind of explore how we record these things? Because remember, they're under huge pressures to make sure they've got evidence for everything. Evidence is a word you hear all the time in education these days. And again, the same teacher, these were found object sculptures from some year sevens he was working with. So the work that they started to make, the things that they were starting to do, were much, much more profound. But what was really interesting was how it was starting to change the way that they were conceptually thinking about their teaching as a whole. Now, I want to talk a little bit, just for a moment, about school art. So there's a massive problem with school art. Um, I'm going to describe most school art to you. It's normally a pepper, and it's normally drawn maybe in colour pencils or sometimes pastels. Okay. Occasionally it's a self-portrait, or if you're very lucky, it's like a half baby, half skull thing on paper. Okay. <laughs> now the journey of school art goes something like this. The teacher stands up in front of the class and they say, this is what we're going to do today. And then the class does it. And then they finish it, and then the teacher marks it. And then they say to the students, would you like it? Do you want to take it home? And most of the students say, no. <laughs> and then the teacher puts it, because normally it's 2D, remember, puts it in a drawer. Unless Ofsted's coming, or there's a parent's evening, in which case maybe they put it on the wall. <laughs> so it goes in a drawer. Now it stays in the drawer. Oh, sometimes the kids do take it home, and it goes in a rucksack and it stays there till it's all crushed at the bottom. <laughs> and if it gets home, it probably gets thrown away, or maybe it gets put on the fridge, but probably not. <laughs> so it goes in the drawer, and then the drawer gets so full that it goes down the back of the drawer. And then around about the third week in July, the teacher suddenly panics and goes, shit, I've got six weeks holiday. I need to clear my room properly so I'm not in a complete mess when I come back. Right, all the classes, Friday, 3 o'clock, if you want anything, come and get it, otherwise it's going. And then they empty all the drawers and all those lovely concertina things are all piled up on a table in the middle of the classroom. And then 3.30 Friday comes, maybe one kid comes in and roots around and finds something, and maybe it's not even theirs and takes it away. And the rest of it all goes in the recycling. Now, that's the journey of school art. And at no point anywhere in that journey did anybody talk about audience? Did anybody talk about context? Did anybody talk about space? About where it was going to be seen? About how it was going to be seen? About why if you place something in the corner, it looks different to something high up on a shelf? Or if you place it in the middle of the room, it's different to on the wall? Or why put something on the wall in the first place? Or whether it should be in something that looks like a gallery, or maybe it shouldn't be? So this, this was really important. Now, one of the teachers in my group said something really, really beautiful. He said, what changed is he realised his curriculum was screen-based and sketchbook-based. And it meant that at the end of every lesson, the evidence of the lesson had gone. Because the computers were logged off of, the sketchbooks were closed, and everything was <coughs> in a drawer. And as soon as he started making sculpture, they were in the room. So the next class would come in and say, who made that? And a conversation would start. So all these things they hadn't expected were beginning to happen. 
So lots of them started thinking, what do we do with the things we make? So this was a kind of Franz West-inspired totem pole project made by a group of 11-year-olds, and this is them deciding where they're going to place it in the school. And this is other people in the school reacting to it. <coughs> this one, particularly fantastic, I think. Uh, so this was, he hasn't got a gallery in the school, but he was making some really interesting work. You've seen this school's come up a few times. Um, and he wanted to think about, well, where, where does this go? How do we encourage people to look at the things that we're making? So with his class, they created these boxes, and then they installed them underneath the stairwell in the school. Uh, so it looked like a load of boxes the caretakers were going to move. But if you went up really close, all the boxes had holes in, and inside were these little worlds they'd made, all lit with LED lights. So what happened at break and lunchtime, as people go into the corridor, is everybody's peering into the boxes. So suddenly, because he was working three-dimensionally, because he was placing things back into the school, it was changing the way in which not just the students he was teaching were thinking about their art, but the school as a whole was thinking about it. So, that's where we got to. Now, the problem is we don't want to finish this project um, because it feels like we've just started this. And the teachers, in fact, what's been so fantastic is the teachers on the project have said, we don't want to finish this project. We're really enjoying meeting up and talking about and sharing these ideas and engaging with things in a different way. So we're going to carry on. So YSI is finished, but the project's going to carry on. And as long as Megan can persuade somebody to employ her beyond December... Uh, we want to carry on the project with Yorkshire as well. So if anybody in the room has got any power to continue employing the brilliant team up here, can you do that so we can carry on funding this project? Um, anyway, that's me. And if, you've got, um, if you're interested, there's loads of other things that we're doing to do with arts education on that website, so please do go on there and subscribe. But um, thank you very much. <laughs>